Disco Wrestling's living legend, and you're watching Monty and the Pharaoh. to grow up and be a man. Come on. All right. Welcome to another special edition of Monty and the Pharaoh scene only here at Village Connection Radio, live from Rockstar Studios in this special Saturday edition. On the board is none other than Stephen Miller. Stephen Miller, how are you, sir? Hey, oh, good morning. And to the right of me is none other than the star of the show, Mr. Jimmy Farrow. Jimmy, how are you? Kiss hangover. Hello. Yeah, we all have a kiss hangover. But more importantly, <laughs> in the room is none other than one of the greatest professional wrestlers of all time, yeah. Mr. Tito Santana. Tito Santana, how are you, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me here. All right. So, have at him, Jimmy Farrow. All righty. As always, we have to have our esteemed introduction for our esteemed guest, ladies and gentlemen. Mercedes Solis, born May 10th, 1953, better known by the ring name Tito Santana, American semi, semi-retired semi professional wrestler at this point, uh, stayed a babyface his entire career, best known for appearances with the World Wrestling Federation between 79 and 83, where of course he was two-time WWF Intercontinental Champion, twice held the WWF Tag Team Championship as well, also 1989 King of the Ring Tournament winner, and wrestled at the first nine WrestleMania events. Uh, growing up being big Pro Wrestling Illustrated uh, readers, he was the PWI Tag Team of the Year in 1979 with Ivan Putski. PWI has ranked him in the top 500 numerous times in 95 and 51. Uh, over in the 2003 PWI years in 93, ranked him number 70 of the PWI 100 Best Tag Teams during the PWI years with, of course, the legendary Rick Martell, and ranked him 92 of the 100 best tag teams in the PWI years in 2003 with the great Polish power Ivan Putski. The resume goes on and on and on. This is a true legend, as I said, of the WWF and the 2004 Hall of Fame class, no less. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Tito Santana. Woo! Tito! Unbelievable. I'm an awesome, sir. Yeah. Thank you. We Thanks. grew up watching yeah, it a this long is, time. This is up there <laughs> on our scale. What do you got, Mike? Well, Tito, let me ask you a question. Um, you grew up as a probably good trying to make pro football, correct? Yes, I did. Uh, uh, I played uh, football at West Texas State, uh, where you probably, guys probably know there's a lot of professional wrestlers that came out of West Texas State, and uh, my first interest was uh, you know playing football. So why professional wrestling? Well, the quarterback uh, at West Texas State, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, or you, I'm, I'm sure you remember him, because he's a big name also, Tully Blanchard. Of course. Tully Blanchard's father was a promoter in San Antonio. And my junior year, they planted the seed. Uh, Tully says, uh, my dad thinks you could have a big career in professional wrestling. Uh, but he says, I, I know that you, because I, uh, I wasn't a wrestling fan, because in Texas it came on really late. So I, I never watched wrestling. So, uh, so you were like kind of scoffing, like, I don't want to be a professional wrestler. What are you talking about? Right, because I didn't know anything about professional wrestling. What position did you play in football, please? I was a tight end. I wonder what it was that made him see this in you. Why you? Did you ask him, why me? Well, because uh, uh, the father told me, he says, uh, he, he talked to me, he said, uh, Merced, uh, you know, you're a big Mexican. You're tall Mexican. You don't, you don't have too many tall okay. Mexicans around. Wow. Okay. And he said, and, and you're not a bad-looking guy. He said, uh, you could have a, a great career in professional wrestling. And this, was, this was Joe Blanchard? This was Joe Blanchard, wow. yeah. Okay. And what, was, was that like a good old boys network at first? Uh, 
Right, because professional wrestling was dominantly a white man's sport, to be honest with you, right? So I right. Mean, did it make you feel uncomfortable? Were they, were they you know, wearing their cowboy sh- at shit kickers and, you know, that well, type of thing? Being from Texas, you know, everybody probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah have them yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, okay. you, you listen to... Funny. You listen to the girls talk, you know, you're either into the way they sound or yeah, they yeah. sound horrible, you yeah. know, with, 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 a, with a cowboy accent, you know, but... but uh, Did Tully have his eyes on wrestling, too, back in college days, too? Um, I mean, I mean, well, obviously his dad's in the business, but, I mean, yeah, was Tully, he Tully, looking to be a wrestler as well? Tully was doing it in the summer, you know, making okay. some pretty good money, so T- okay. Tully was ahead, ahead of me in, in, as far as the ring goes, uh, and, and, and Tully turned out to be a great talent. Every oh professional wrestler that had a father that did it, you know, for some reason, they just caught on, you know. Natural. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you wind up being trained by Bob Orton Sr.? Well, when I first started, uh, I decided I tried, uh, well, I did two years of uh, professional football, one in, with the Chiefs and one with, uh, went, I ended up going to Canada. Canada, Canada right. Uh, I told him after the Chiefs deal, I got cut, then I went to Canada and spent the rest of the year there. I said, I want to play one more year, and then I'd like to start training. And that's what happened. I went back and played, uh, you know, the following year. Uh, came back in, at the end of November and started to... Uh, I, I told my, I, my family had no idea that I was going to become a professional wrestler. I, I spent Christmas with at, at home with my mom, and I said, uh, you know... I'm going to become a professional wrestler. I'm going to San Antonio and I'm going to start training. And my mom says, what does a professional wrestler do? And, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and I kind of explained it a little bit. But, you know, uh, from there, I went to uh, uh, Tampa, Florida. Tully was going to start uh, in the territory as a, as a wrestler because he was, Tully was polished already. So he came in to start, you know, they brought him in to, uh, you know, to go into wrestling. I just started training in the ring, you know. Uh, Barry Orton was in there training, and the the father uh, was the one that was training. I'm, I'm talking. I'm talking about Bob Orton Senior, not not this Bob Orton. Right. Senior, correct. The, yeah. The correct. one before then. Mm-hmm. And and uh, now, did you say you were training with Barry Orton? Also, I was training with Barry. Yeah. And Junior Bob Orton Junior too. Uh, Bob would come in once in a while. Yeah. And and, and worked out with us, you know, and. and uh, Bob was uh, tag team champions, I believe, with uh, Bob Roop uh, at mm-hmm. the time, and you know I, I used to admire the you know Bob was always a great worker in the ring. You know, right. and, and, so he, your your first dab in the pro ranks is a little bit of uh, Florida, a little bit of Georgia, correct? Before uh, I, you got to Vince? Yeah, well, I, I started out in, in Florida, and I ended up having four matches. I was there about three or four months, and uh, Jim Barnett. Uh, owned part of Florida and Jim Barnett took a liking to me and all of a sudden I hear that he wants to bring me in, into Atlanta and I had four matches when I left Florida and they were going to give me a big push well you know I had to learn how to crawl four matches I wasn't ready to work on top anywhere you know because you, you Back then, you guys remember, the, you know, the interviews had to be polished, you know. Mm-hmm. Everybody that was on top, I mean, they could talk. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't scripted either, right? It wasn't you, you, right. You had to yeah. shoot from the hip, stuff. you had to right. be sharp, you had to be quick, you had to yeah. be to the point, you had to get over. That's well, right. You know, yeah. since, since you're mm-hmm. rolling into that, quick question. Um, what's more important to be a professional wrestler, a great professional wrestler, Matt skill or Mike skills? Well, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, I remember Med Dog Vashon who, uh, when I was against, from, I made a few moves and then up in Minnesota. In Minnesota, the AWA, they had some, you know, fantastic Mike people. You had uh, Baron Von Raschke, uh, uh, Mad Dog Vashon, uh, uh, the Bruiser, uh, and they all could, unbelievable speakers on, on the mic. Uh, Ken Patera and, and the, uh, Vashon, Met, uh, Met Dog Vashon used to say, wrestling is 10%, interviews is 90%. You sell your tickets with your interviews. 
and that's the way it was. I mean, I don't know if you, you know, yeah. Roddy Piper. I mean, oh my God, you know, he 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 sold tickets with, yep. you know, with his mouth. You know? Flair. What did what did you think of your interview like style? Did you think you were one of the top interview guys? Uh, I wouldn't consider myself uh, in in the same uh, level. I, I had a different style. I think uh, you know. I didn't consider myself in the, in the likes of uh, Mad Dog Vachon or, well, or to be, Roddy Piper. You to know? be fair to you, though, doesn't the face require a different approach than the heel in a mm. promo? He's right. got to be different. It's going to be a different effect. I always felt that your energy level, whether you were doing a promo or you were in the ring, and by the way, your matches hold up fantastically over the years, your energy level is off the charts. So as a heel, you were delivering what you needed to deliver to the fans. Now, I want to ask you, how do you wind up with Vince McMahon? You basically just... Barely get your toes in the water when it comes to Florida and Georgia, and boom, it seems like you're at Vince fairly quick. What happened there? How do you get to Vince? Well, it, it, it did happen very quick. You know, I, I never expected to get to New York. We, I knew that they were selling out Mer Madison Square Garden every Monday, pretty much. On did a this intimidate basis. you when you were contacted? Is this too fast, too soon, by no, any chance? No. Or are you just excited? Let's go for it. Yeah, I, I was just excited, but okay. from. Atlanta, I went to Charlotte, spent a year there, and then Blackjack Mulligan and Dick Murdoch bought Amarillo territory, and I went to college in Amarillo, in, in Kenyon, and uh, they were going to bring me in and, and, and uh, make a big Mexican star, they told me. I mean, <laughs> the carrot again. And uh, I get there, and I was a baby face, and Dick Murdoch was a baby face, and uh, Blackjack, wasn't, Blackjack wasn't there. My first TV taping... I go to do TV, and, and I have a draw with Stan Lane, and I know that if they're going to give you a big push, I, I, I had only been in the business about two and a half years, I know if they're going to give you a big push, you're not going to get a draw on TV. Mm -hmm. So right there I knew, something's up. you know, something's up. Yeah. So I ended up staying uh, there two and a half months before I started in New York. Uh, Andre the Giant and I had become friends. I met Andre the Giant before I moved to Florida, I started out in, in Texas just as a referee, and uh, I became friends with Andre. And then when I went to Atlanta, I had a little Granada, and I, you know, I was the low man in the totem pole. So Ole Anderson says, "You're gonna go pick up Andre the Giant at the airport." And I had a little Granada, got in my car, and he broke my, <laughs> broke funny. my seat. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> yeah. What so, did he put his head out the window? Right. Now wait a minute. This is the, this is your thought. first. Uh, first time you meet Andre is for, it, it, picking him up this in the Granada. Well, uh, well, I had just really met him before, and, right. then, I, uh, and then I picked what, up. I what picked color him was the Granada? I'm, I wrote the, It was black. <laughs> I want That's the full picture. Hilarious. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious. So uh, good friend to have. Good yeah. friend to have. So okay, I got a bigger car, and whenever Andre was in town, you know, Andre knew he was going to travel with me. You know, I I, I took a, you know, he he was going to travel with me. You know, it, it, he had an open invitation. And he was a very nice guy. Uh, all of a sudden, he comes to Amarillo because Andre would, you know, would travel all over the world. And I mean, he was a, the eighth wonder of the world. So I partied with Andre. I was single, you know, and I, oh and I, I did party with Andre. And oh boy! I let him stay in my apartment. As a matter of fact, I let him stay in my bedroom, and uh, I, I, I started laughing because his legs were hanging over. <laughs> I saw him sleeping, but. Uh, well, here's the first uh, hard question. Let me, let okay, me finish okay, this. Unknown to me, Andre leaves. Yeah. And he he takes a tape from me wrestling in Amarillo and brings it to Vince McMahon oh, Sr. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. And I, I had no idea. Oh, boy. And that's before you know it, I'm on my way to, to, to New York. Wow. So, so Sr. calls you. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. All right, back to the Andre thing wow. real quick. So cool. he stays in your apartment, right? So uh, did you see the HBO documentary on Andre? Yeah. How'd you like it? I, I thought it was done I thought it was fantastic. Well. Nice. Yeah. Really nice. So here's my big question to you. Did you have to clean up the uh, the bathtub? Because you certainly couldn't use your toilet bowl, right? Well, uh, <laughs> that is bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, they, they, they mentioned in the documentary that the, the certain, man yeah, could he, not, you know. There was limitations. Like, the he there went. was limitations yeah. on what he could do. Yeah, well, I don't remember... Having an issue? Uh, I, <laughs> that's good. That's good to know. But, but, but you guys got to remember, I was single, and you know, and I was partying quite a bit myself. So maybe right. he was there. And I, I didn't right. really All I'm saying is, I would be sweating it. Like, <laughs> where's this guy gonna go to the bathroom in my apartment when he leaves? What am I doing? You know what I mean? But anyway, how many beers could that man consume? I, I heard that at one sitting, uh, he 
he drank 116 beers. Dear Lord. You know, besides a, a <laughs> besides a little bit of wine and stuff. Wow. We used to travel and, and, and go to different bars and, and, and you know, because Andre had been around for quite a while. Yeah. A lot of these bars had those big mugs. That was Andre's mug. Nobody else used it. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he drank a lot more than he ate. I didn't see him eat too often. Ooh. How long could you how long could you drink with him before you were done? Uh, now you were young, so I expect yeah, you got a couple get, of hours yeah, here, expect, right? Expect to hang, hang it in a there a while, while, right? I, I, uh, <laughs> it's true. You know, in Texas, the beer was a little weaker. I don't know if you guys knew that. <laughs> really? Yeah. No. no, no, no like, why is it weaker? Uh, wow. I I don't know. It's a little they, surprising. They had like a two point something, you know, the Coors. <laughs> wow. So uh, Austin's really but, not all that. But, uh, right. Interesting. I could put away a I could put away a case myself. Wow, nice. I'm impressed. You know, so so uh, that's impressive. But that's when I was single. You know, <laughs> I, I, as I what are you older, down to like three I, beers I started, now? What are you telling me? <laughs> funny. I don't even drink at all anymore after that. So I I hear you. I wanted to ask you. You know, you get to you get to Vince now, and it's very early in your career, and you win tag gold with the. Uh, Ivan Putski, um, any thoughts on Ivan? Sometimes, I'm stepping on Mike's question a little bit, forgive me, Mike. Sometimes uh, we hear things that Ivan was a little rough in the locker room with certain people. Is there or, any truth Or he to wasn't that? liked. Or he wasn't liked. You know, and, 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 he you would, know, and he would never sell, right? And, uh, and just, you know. just curious, did he grade on some people in the back? We hear stories about him, about Mr. Fuji. Certain guys were not so nice from what we hear to certain wrestlers in the back. Was he a bit of a razzer to some of the guys, Putski? Uh, I, I never saw, saw it, but I know that uh, I always heard that Ivan was about Ivan. Okay. I mean... Well, you didn't hang with Ivan like when you guys were tag team champions? No. So you're no. just like, all right, bye. Yeah, we, 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 we teamed up and we, we had our matches and, you know, that was about it. It was professional. That right. Was. So is that is that a telling tale that you weren't a big fan of Ivan? It just... Uh, no, no, it's just, I think the age difference, you know. Okay. Fair uh, enough. Yeah, you know he 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 wasn't partying like uh, me as a single guy. He was married, and you know uh, I think family was important to him also. And so he wasn't out partying like me as a single guy. You know, partying my butt off. You know, and having a great time. Yeah, because uh, professional wrestling was a great uh, business to be in for a single guy. Did but we, I did know you? the stories that that he wasn't well liked, and that a lot of the guys when they teamed me up with him, I guess. Vince Senior uh, asked him if he wanted to be teamed up with me, and, and he said yes. Well, he he went for the weekend because he would he would always fly home on the weekend uh, to watch his kids play sports, and then they fly him back. So when he was gone, I was had been in the business just a little over uh, three years right. when they were going to team me up and and uh, make me a tag team champion with him. Uh, they're telling me, you know, Andre, I mean, uh, uh, Butsky's not going to sell for you. He's going to make you do all the work. And, then he hits you know, a Polish so, 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 hammer so, so, and you so get out of it. Then he goes like this. Yeah, and, yeah. All just, right, Tino, you do all the work. I'll, I'll finish him off with the Polish hammer and we'll, right. I'm leaving. Bye. So he comes back and I, Fair enough. You know, I go talk to him and I said, uh, Ivan, I said, I mean, <laughs> shit's coming down. I said, everybody <laughs> keeps telling me that, you know, that you're going to do this and this and this. And, this. and then he says, Tito. He says they're jealous. They're jealous of me. Oh, yeah. Nobody, nobody. Do you know anybody else that can go home on the weekends? Like Vince would fly him back and pick up his rent a car, and you know he had a pretty sweet deal. Yeah, you know, I have been pusky. So he says they're jealous of me. Don't listen to him. I, I, I told Vince, Mc, Vince McMahon Senior that I wanted to be your partner. You know. We worked in the ring. You know he was okay as far as yeah. I'm concerned. You know what this sounds like. You know, maybe they were jealous of me, you know, and that day they're flying him back and forth, everybody else is busting their ass. Right. Yeah. Makes some sense. He was to me. way over with the crowd too, Putski. I mean he, he was, was. He, he was yeah. he was way over with the crowd. Um were you able to avoid uh you know, you talk about partying, were you able to avoid the hardcore hardcore drugs? Yeah, I, I you know you realize how fortunate you are and also smart that you were able to yeah, avoid the hardcore drugs. I, I, I came from uh Migrant, we were migrant workers growing up, and okay. you know, I, I, uh, I was a migrant worker until I went to college. You know, uh, so, so it's basically just beer drinking or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but real quick, right? So, look, we're huge fans of yours. Um, there's a couple of pictures of you next to Hogan. You know, back in the day, mm. you're a pretty big dude. You didn't juice at all. 
No, no. Really? No. Because I gotta tell you, you can, size wise, how'd you you're pull there. It? How'd you you're pull there. it off? How'd you pull it off? You must have been working out like what? How many hours a day? What was in no, your no, prime? No, no. We used to we used to work out seven days a week. We were on the road all the time. Mm. We'd fly into a place. The first thing we'd do was go to the Mr. Y. I used to, I used to hang out with the heels because, you know, the baby phase were your competition, not the heels. Right. So Mr. Wonderful was my best friend. And, uh, like, I could bench press 425, and, nice. and Mr. Wonderful was juicing, and, and he couldn't do it. And, and you didn't feel the pressure? With all, you're in you the age where these guys, guys are all juicing. At some point, you're right? in great shape. You just felt like, Basically, hey, I'm, I'm doing this on my own. I'm good to go. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, there was a point when I, when I asked Vince, Vince, the, the Vince now. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, Vince, I said, do you want me to juice? He says, no, you don't have to juice. Wow. Whoa. You, you know, he says. Interesting. Uh, Vince says no. And, 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 wow. And, 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 and Tony Headless walked by. <laughs> and, <laughs> he walked and, yeah, he, and he says, you know, if he, wants, like, you if, he, if he wants to destroy his life, you know, that's his choice. He oh, says, wow. but I make, I make the decision, I don't make the decisions uh, on somebody juicing. Right. He wow. Says, you don't Very have, interesting. He, he told me you don't have to juice. Oh. I mean. I, I still look like I'm in pretty good shape, and yeah, you know, I'm, great I'm, shape, I'm not juicing. You know, I don't juice, but I was a natural uh, lifter. You know, I, I was pretty strong. You know, mm -hmm. but I was I was an athlete pretty much all my life. So, when you uh, get done with this this first run with the WWF, you move over to the AWA. Um, you wrestled Nick Bockwinkle. Was this like a uh, Culture shock, the styles, the different, the difference between the AWA and the way the WWF was run in those days. How different was it for you, and how easy was the transition? And working with a genius like Bachwinkle must have been pretty cool. Any thoughts on the AWA experience? Well, the transition for me was fairly easy because the 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 the, the, the style in the AWA they had wrestlers there. You know, uh, New York had the big guys. You know, yeah. they, they were used to the Bruno San Martino wrestling big guys and. Right. I mean, who, who was more powerful than Bru Bruno San Martino? Mentioned mm -hmm. five sixty-five. You know, natural also. Yeah. So the transition was easy for me. Uh, the difference that I saw over there. I mean, everybody on the card in the AWA was a, was a top worker. I mean, the, uh, Matt workers. Yeah, Vern used to have five matches, and and sell out. You know, uh, St. Paul, which held about twenty thousand people. With five matches, everybody could work, and they'd give you time. Here, there's some guys that were horrible workers, and they were on top, but, you know, they had great gimmicks. Right. You know, so it was a completely but is, different... But is there a huge money change, though, leaving New York? So, okay, WWE's the only thing in town now, but back in the day, you had all your regionals, and, you know, nowadays, everybody says, you know, when you made it to New York, that was the mecca did you feel that way, or at that time was it different? Was it NWA was more important, AWA, or was New York the mecca when you when you made it there? That was it, and that was where all the money was. Well, uh, not necessarily because, like the payoffs in in in, uh, in in the AWA were right. the first the first you know I was pretty young in my career. I had been in the business maybe a little over four years when I got got to to Minnesota. And my first twenty five hundred dollar payoff for a show uh, was in was in the in the AWA, wow. right? Because they had less people to pay. You know, the payoffs were better. Everybody got paid pr pretty good. Plus, when you went, the territories were all still very strong. WWF, NWA, AWA, right. they were all strong yeah. at, the, at that point. So, so I was making, I made as much money in in, in the AWA that it, that I did when, when I was in New York. Uh, and you had a, you almost had like a normal life because they had a, they had a plane, they had a, they had a, a Cessna that w they, w if we went any distance, the main event guys, they'd fly eight of us in the, in the plane. Wow. So we'd, we'd leave at five and we'd be back by between 12 and one, you know, in the morning. Uh, and, and you spend a lot of time at home in the summers. Time was slow, and, and Vern would run maybe six to eight shows a, a month. So you had a lot of days off. So I was working a lot less and making the same kind of money that I was making in, in New York. I loved, you know, you could live like, almost like a normal life. Do you feel that Vern Gagne and Luthes are almost uh, 
underrated historically at this point compared to a Bruno San Martino because Vince won the war and the focus nowadays with the younger fans when they tune in it's WWE history WWF history do you feel like a, a giant like a Vern Gagne in the ring for how many decades or Luthez or, or almost like Bruno's equivalents but just don't get that credit anymore because history turned out that you know Vince was king any uh, thoughts on that with those two guys because sometimes I wonder about where they rest in the history books when we struggled yeah. to come up with the all-time great wrestlers, yeah. Ganya and Fez, to me, were like the Brunos of their territories for right. many years. Any thoughts on that? N not really, you know, because to me it was a different era, you mm -hmm. know. And, and, and to me it was all TV, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're, theirs were localized. And over here, Vince McMahon became yeah. really big. Into the juggernaut. He started expanding and, 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 and you know, taking over the world. Any thoughts on Bachwinkle? I've always found him to be a master psychologist as far as the, his approach. I mean, I had my first hour draw match with Nick Bachwinkle, and, you know, I was pretty young, and he, he carried Boy, me, and, and, and he... How much did you learn from that oh one God, match? It was unbelievable. He, wow. He, he would tell me when to sell, when to make a comeback, you know, wow. and he would stop me, and, you know, he, he uh, quite an education. I was supposed. To, I just talked to Bruce Richard a couple of months ago, and uh, they brought me into Houston, and I had a few matches with uh, Nick Bockwinkle, and I was supposed to. Bruce told me that uh, the promoter in Houston, Paul Bosch, wanted to put the AWA title on me, and then that's about the time when I came back to to New York the second time around. Well, speaking of that, when you come back to New York, Vince calls you back. Does he? Two things. Does he? Talk to you about his plan of this takeover, and can you compare the promoters, Senior, Junior, and Vern Gagne, the difference between the three? Well, to me, Vince Senior was very classy. Everybody uh, says we that. We hear this yeah. all the time. says that. He, he, he never made me any promises, but uh, I left the AWA, I went back to... Atlanta, Georgia, when mm -hmm. I left the AWA, and again they were going to make me a big, big, uh, you know, Oli says that we're going to make you an international star because our TV goes all over the world. TBS. Kind of getting a feeling you're not a big fan of Oli. No, okay. he's the only guy that I have nothing good to say about. Interesting. Yeah. In the Reasons business. just because he lied to you, or does it go beyond that? Uh, he's pretty scummy. Really yeah. now? Yeah, he, he, he... Interesting. He, he disrespected you. He, he, you know, called you Mexican and, you know, with disrespect and... Uh, Did you ever want to, like, just beat his ass? Yeah. Or was it... Or yeah. was only... Like, <laughs> or was only... <laughs> fact, yes. Or was only... You know, only pretty big dude, too. So it's like, can I beat his ass? That type... Now, obviously, you're well, a strong I'm guy. I'm going with him. So... <laughs> No, it, you know, he was the boss, so... Yeah, you got to think know, about that right, one. Yeah. Right, Yeah, but at right. this point, you've got a pretty big name. You're flowing around. You know, you That's know, you're true. No you joke. are established. It's like, hey, yourself, you know, yeah, I, I'm sure like if you would have had a fight with him, maybe it would have caused issues within other promotions, but I get it. Right, yeah. No, it, it, I, I was always pretty low-keyed, but uh, what was the question that I was... <laughs> So you actually, go to Atlanta, Oli promises you a whole bunch of stuff. You're going to head to the WWE. Oh, okay. So it's a two-prong two so, question. So, so I, I, leave, I leave Minnesota, and I come to Atlanta, and they gave me a, a guarantee. The, uh, Tully Blanchard tried to get me to Texas, but I wanted a guarantee, and Tully wouldn't give me a guarantee. And Tully would say, if you get over, you're going to make the guarantee that you're asking for. But by that time, I knew if I'm going to get over you're going to get me over right. with TV. You know, I, I can get myself over, mm -hmm. but if you're going to put me in and have a draw the first day of TV mm -hmm. taping, mm -hmm. I, I understood the business, you know, better by, yeah. by, by the time I got there. So they bring me in, and they're, again, they're not doing nothing on TV. They're not doing nothing on TV. My wife delivered a baby uh, shortly after we got to Atlanta. We bought a condominium, and I, I wanted to stay there, and Oli starts treating me like shit, and all of a sudden he says, uh, uh, Bill Watts wants you really bad in Louisiana. And I said, uh, I don't want to go to Louisiana, because Paul Orndorff, again, had told me he'd been there, says, the trips are very, very long. You're on the road all the time, and the payoffs are the shits. That's what Paul <laughs> said. And what, what, what were the rumors about Bill Watts? Uh, well, Did that kind of scare you off, too? Like, No, no? it's just the, the payoffs were bad. Okay. You know? That's the only thing that... Didn't have a good rep. Right. 
So uh, all of a sudden, I'm getting booked in Louisiana uh, from Atlanta, one week in Louisiana, one week over here. Wow. And, and uh, Oli and Bill Watts are working an angle on me. And they, they're going to make... And they know. They, 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 and they know what's going on in your personal life. You just had right. a baby. You're yeah. trying to plant your feet, right. and they're doing this. Oh, I can understand why he feels this way. Absolutely. Okay, douchebaggery. So, okay, right. yeah. So Oli yeah. gets rid of my, my guarantee, and then Bill Watts is paying me way more than I was making in Atlanta. So they were working the shit out of me, and, and Paul would say, he, they want, Bill wants you, but once you get there, I guarantee he's going to screw you. Wow. So I get to Louisiana. Finally, I couldn't take it anymore. Because I wasn't making diddly in, in, in Atlanta with Oli. And I I, uh, I told my wife, I said, I, I think we're gonna I think we're gonna have to move to Louisiana. Wow. So I'm doing TV, I'm doing TV in Louisiana, and I tell Bill Watts, I figured I, I figured I had some negotiating power. And I tell Bill Watts, I said, Bill, I'd like to talk to you about coming into Louisiana. This was on a Tuesday. He says I can't talk to you right now. I'll talk to you when I get to Houston on Friday. I said, now he's freaking with me. Now, now he knows he's got me. Mm. So I called Vince Sr. and I said, Vince, I said, uh, I'm going to leave Atlanta. I think I'm going to talk to Bill Watts about uh, going to Louisiana. So he says, yeah. He says, uh, Bill Watts is a good, good boy. I said, uh, you know, it would be a good place for you to go. I get to Houston with Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog and I were traveling together. And I enter the dressing room and Ernie Ladd says, uh, son, <laughs> you got a big decision to make. He says, Bill Watts wants you really bad here and Vince McMahon wants you really bad mm. in New York. And I said, shit. You know, my wife is from Parsippany, New Jersey. I said, this, you know, I can give you the answer right now. There you go. I want to go back, you know. You know, he says, no, 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 Bill, don't say nothing. Don't tell, don't tell Bill that I t told you this. Right. So Bill comes in and he, and he t pulls me aside and he says, uh, he says, uh, Tito, he says, you 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 got a lot of talent. He says, but you need to get polished and I can polish you here. You know, I want, I want, I want you to stay here with me. And I said, Bill, you know, I, and I, I didn't. I bullshit him. I said, you know, my wife's from New York. I said, I, I want to go to New York. So he says, well, Vince wants you to call him in the morning. So I had Vince's senior's phone number, so I called Vince in the morning, and I called Vince, and there was a, a silence on the phone. It seemed like silence for forever. And I said, don't tell me that Vince is also on this freaking yeah, right. angle. Mm. You know, so I said, finally, I... I, I, I got a little pissed off and I said, Vince, the reason I called you is because I was told to call you. And he says, yep, your starting date is May 10th. You're gonna do TV May 10th and 11th. Uh, nine weeks, every three weeks, you're gonna be doing TV. He says, it's time for you to come home. He mm -hmm. didn't make me any promises. Right. And I said, that's all I needed to hear. Wow. You know, so I called my wife and said, we're going to New York. And then Oli was pissed off because I was going to New York. Well, was yeah. Vern pissed off that you left the AWA no, too? No, no, I, I was in, in the, for Vern for... When you went from Vern to Atlanta, did yeah. Vern give you shit about that? No, 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 Vern, Vern, Vern booked me. He and, booked and, you and, over, and, okay. He helped yeah, you, gotcha. He, he, you know, back then you, you stayed in, in a territory a year or two. And then they moved you and, on. Yeah, then they moved you on. Okay, and they all worked together. Right. So, it was all, so yeah. at this point, when you're coming up to New York with Senior, you... You knew about Junior. I guess you have met him a few times, right? He was interviewing back in the day. And, right. Um, did you know he was about to take over the company? I had no idea. So he, here's a, another question for you. Pedro Morales, who recently passed away, right. a great, great icon. Um, did you feel that they were bringing you in to be the new Pedro Morales of the WWE? Uh, to be honest with you, I... I I didn't know much about Pedro at all, you know. I, I I didn't even know that he had been the world champ world champion. Really? You know, yeah. Okay. Excuse me. So I didn't I didn't know why they were bringing me in. He didn't make me any promises. 
you know, I had no idea that I was going to become the Intercontinental Champion shortly after after I got here. Mm. They had the plans. He didn't share any of that with me. So I just came in, and I, I just came in. I, I was just happy for the opportunity to, to Which, to by the way, really upset me, all right? Because you took down oh, my boy, boy, Don Morocco. I oh, freaking boy. hated you, bro. This, I hated this, you. This is, this is the portion of the program where you come into our lives. I, we were in junior high at the point that you come back for your second stay with Vince, right? Uh -huh. So I got him into wrestling around the time Sergeant Slaughter was doing his Cobra Clutch Challenge. Right. Within a couple of years, he decides he loves Magnificent Morocco. I decide I love Greg Valentine. You know where you fit in this picture, <laughs> don't you, Tito? It's Tito so shows up, and we had just lived through the Pedro yeah. Morales experience yeah. where he yeah. took the belt from Don. Tito shows up and takes the title from Don Morocco. Yeah. And these two 17-year-olds are going, point, Rah! At that point, I have to ask you, did you... Were you aware of how important this title was because this was when this belt really meant something. You were, after the champion, you were number two. You had the most important belt besides the big one. Were you aware of how important the title was and what was it like working with the Magnificent Morocco? Well, the Magnificent Morocco was, I mean... He was an unbelievable champion, and he was a great worker. <laughs> wow! And, and, and we loved him know, in Florida. You guys know that <laughs> before that, we got to Vince, that the wrestlers uh, we talk in the ring, right? You, you guys, I'm sure you guys yeah, know. Of course. Yeah. But Morocco spoke pigeon English, <laughs> so he, he would go high spot, and I couldn't understand it. Like that Hawaiian was, stuff. Yeah, right. <laughs> So well, he, he wasn't eating a sandwich in the middle right, of the match. Right. So he threw you know. me in the ring, and you know, I said, "What the? What's coming?" So I, I had to be pretty quick on my feet to, to anticipate what he was doing, you know. But uh, well, we couldn't tell. You guys were great, <laughs> great together. So, but he was a he was a great worker. I mean, he was a great heel. I mean, he and and as far as his style of interviews, I mean, let it, me ask you that he he gets a little on those interviews back in the day. He get a little bit crazy. Were you ever offended by some of the things he used to say? No, no. It was okay, just oh, a little joke. crazy. Well, because I knew it was, <laughs> was a work. Horrendous. Okay, everything was a work. <laughs> well, you know, again, you came from the good old boy network, where like guys like Ole Anderson, it wasn't a work. They right. were actually yeah. pure, one hundred percent racist. Right. right. So, you know, I, I'd figure maybe your 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 ire was up a little bit. No, I mean, Bobby Heenan and and uh, and uh, Jesse the Body Ventura. Yeah. Used to put me down, you know, and and, and was, whenever those top, wait a minute, whenever those top heels would put you down, they were really they, actually they were helping here. you, yeah. Uh, did what Chico Santana yeah. was it that Jesse? It that was, was Jesse. Jesse. And, 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 yeah. Oh my and, god, flying burrito. <laughs> yeah. What what the frig? I didn't realize he was calling me on the air, Chico right. Santana. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'd go to different towns. And by this time, I was a champion, and I was over pretty big, and everybody would be going, Hey, Chico! And I was getting pissed off. You know, and, 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 yeah, there's racist <laughs> bastards over here. You know. so, That's funny. So, That's uh, funny. What's this Chico yeah. stuff? Did you go back to Jesse? Uh, then the, 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 no, <laughs> then I, I happened to be watching this. Jesse's calling me Chico. <laughs> You know, they, they asked, they asked uh, oh, Jesse God. if he had anybody that he would work, if he had one choice. Okay. And he said he uh, Tito Santana, you know, by far would be the guy that I would want to work against. Wow. How does that make you feel? Makes me feel good, you know, because uh, I felt I would always let the heel lead the match. I would adjust to the heel. Right. You know, so I could wrestle with the little guy. I could wrestle with the big guy. And, and uh, you know, it's like a good... You know, like if, if you're a good dancer, mm. you know, the man leads the woman. Mm -hmm. Well, I was the woman in the ring, you know, being led by the heel. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I, uh, but they always talked about, they love working with me because when it was time for me to make a comeback, I had fire coming out of my, you know what. You know, oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, uh, oh, yeah. I let it go. When, when the time was right, I, I'd let it go and. They used to love that. Speaking of master heels, you weren't done haunting me and my partner back in those days. <laughs> Once you were done haunting my partner with the Morocco deal, you come and you haunt me with my great favorite, Greg the Hammer Valentine, another awesome heel. Can you uh, describe what it was like working with Greg as compared to Morocco? What was he like in the ring with? Greg was uh, like a pit bull. I mean, Greg uh, it, it would just keep coming at you, you know, and... and, and, it, and, and I don't know if you guys remember, I was in there fighting for my life, you know. Bro, we remember everything. 
I remember all your, we remember every match, everything you did. So, yeah. yeah. So, so I, I was the one that decided, okay, I'm going to give him this much and I'm going to fight back. I'm going to give him this much and fight back. But by that time, I, I could call stuff in the ring because I, I, I became. You've been around now. Yep. I became, you know, where I really understood the business and I understood my role as a baby face. So I could interject. I, I would call spots myself, you, you know. And, uh, were, you, were you ever asked to become a heel? No, uh, when me and Rick Martell split up, uh, Rick was gone for almost a year, and I heard he was coming back, and I asked Vince, I, I wanted to be a heel because I said, uh, You're I, dead. I, I, I'm a good worker. Mm. I, I think I, I had seen other baby faces turn heels, and they had done a pretty good job. I figured I could have a, another good run as a heel, and I asked Vince, I said, uh, Can I become the heel? Because they were going to split us up. Yeah. He says, no, you're going to stay the baby face. He, he says, I need you as a baby face. Well, we, they split us up, and they really never did anything. They put the Metador gimmick on me, but they never really did anything with the Metador gimmick either. Right, right. So when you return to WWE, you meet Junior, right? You find out that he's going to take the business from Dad, right? Yep. Does he start sharing with you his overall, like, taking over the wrestling his world? Vision. and? At that point, do you agree with this kind of method? Being that you, you know, you you grew up in the regions, you had a bunch of friends, you knew a lot of guys going to get put out of business, or did you even believe he could do it? Well, he didn't start sharing that with us. The, the people that started sharing that, uh, I remember, Pat Patterson is the one that would come in and say, <laughs> "Okay, our TV is going to go into Montreal. Our TV is going to start going into Minnesota. Our TV, you know, every three weeks because we would do TV tapings, we'd find out." would be going into, you know, different uh, different t uh, territories. You know, the, the move had begun. When you first heard about the idea of WrestleMania, when you were told about it for the first time, did you think it would work? We had no, we had no idea, but uh, before, because uh, I was good friends with uh, Terry Funk, you know, because Terry Funk was also from West Texas State, and. He helped me, you know, I almost gave up wrestling in, in Florida. Terry Funk was the, was the world champion, and I had met him when I was playing football in college because he played football at West Texas State. So I told Terry, I said, I'm, I'm just going to go home and start getting ready for it because I had signed another contract to go to play for the BC Lions again. Wow. And he says, let me talk to Eddie Graham. And then he talked to Eddie Graham, and that's when I started getting booked. Because I was just working out, working out, working out. I wasn't making any money. I still had to pay the rent for the for the apartment and food and expenses. So Terry Funk had told me that uh, he says, before you know it, he says we're not going to be going into high schools anymore. It's going to be we're going to be flying. It's going to be all over the place. And this was several Terry years. Terry Sword coming. Yeah, several several years before. Nice. Well, here we are at WrestleMania. Yeah, here we are at WrestleMania. So here comes WrestleMania. Why did they choose you to open up the match, and were you excited to be against Playboy Buddy Rose? First ever and, match in WrestleMania And history. thoughts on Playboy Buddy Rose. Nice. Well, Playboy Buddy Rose was, was a great talent, but he wasn't in the territory, and under the mask, it wasn't going to help any. You know, th there was no heat there, right. no heat between him and I. It was just a match. Right. Right. Uh, I was in, in the middle of a feud with Greg the Hammer Valentine, where, you know, Greg... And I were really selling out arenas without big arenas with us in the main event, without Hogan being there. Uh, they put us in the card. You know, you know, we had I don't know how many re return matches we had. You know, our Broadways, time limit Broadways, and, and, and uh, we were drawing some money. So all of a sudden, uh, we we have the the biggest event that's taking place. I had no idea where it was going to go, uh, and I, I'm in I'm in the opening match. Yeah. And I, I'm pretty upset, you know, because I really, uh, yeah, I'm pretty upset because, because you know, I'm, now I'm gonna, now I'm opening up a card, you know, to me, uh, somebody opened up a yeah, card. back in the day, yeah, opening right, up a right, card gotcha. with no heat while in the meantime you were right. selling out yeah. shows why, with why, Valentine. Why am I not? Yeah, you what, know, wrestling, what was that? You know, why okay. why is my match not a big match in I WrestleMania one? Uh, and I'm pretty upset. I'm in the curtain, ready to go outside with a, with an attitude. Uh, and right before I go through the, through the curtains, Vince Jr. Uh, walks up to me as I'm standing there in the court, in, behind the curtain, and he says, uh, "Tito, the reason I 
put you in the first matches because I need for you to go out and get the people the people off their asses. Mm. This is, you're the one that can do it. Right there, I had a different perception of what my job was. And, uh, you know, it, it changed everything. And now, now that, that I'm it was the first major later, WrestleMania yeah, history. It was the biggest thing. It, it turned well, out know, to be you know one what? of the biggest things well, in my career. Here's the most important question. And you're on the spot here because we've had like Lanny Poffo, Greg Valentine, right? They've all told us. Oh, this. here it comes. And they all answered. What was it? the WrestleMania payday? WrestleMania won. What was the payday? Uh, they paid me. Dollars and cents. Seven seventy five hundred dollars. <laughs> okay. For the opening match, and I was pretty pissed off. I would be pissed. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm right actually, now. I'm pissed. Off. I'm annoyed. I am. Yeah. Pissed. I didn't do anything. And, I'm annoyed. And, and, and I called. <laughs> I thought you were gonna say seventy five thousand no. dollars. Yeah, what's going on Holy here? Shit. And, and I called. Oh, and lame. I called the office. Uh, and, and, I talked Pat, to, and did I, Pat Patterson say, "Come meet me in my back room. We'll have a talk." <laughs> <laughs> no, thank God. No, 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 no William, no. So, oh my God, I called the office and I talked to Jim Barnett. Right. Okay. And and uh, you know, I, I let him know that I wasn't yeah. happy about my huh. payoff, and uh, I ended up getting another check for seventy five hundred dollars. So I ended up getting fifteen hundred. Okay. All right, fifteen thousand. That's okay. You know. Yeah. I'm a little less annoyed, but I'm, I'm still, still annoyed. Two times, two <laughs> th- I mean, they, you know. It, Listen, you're, mean, in a, you're definitely in the top five or six intercontinental. And yeah. It, you know, for a wrestling time, fan, the intercontinental yeah. belt's a big deal. So yes. I'm a little bit pissed. Yeah. Vince McMahon, Jr., share your opinions of him. You already said Sr., stand-up guy, everybody loves him. Vern, I guess you had an okay relationship with. Jr.? Jr. was strictly a businessman. You know, a lot of people would come into New York and, and, and they'd have a run. And as long as they, and I, and I saw it, you know, because I was here longer than anybody else, yeah. you know, at the time when I had my run. And I saw a lot of guys come and go. Oh, yeah. And the guys would come in and they were making money, you know, on top, top heels. And Vince was a great guy. But the, the run didn't last forever. And all of a sudden, the run was over, and Vince became a prick. <laughs> you know, with me, I, I experienced that. Vince, when when Vince dealt with the with the two top matches of, of the big cards, then they had the different agents that would deal with the other matches. You know how to set them up. So for a long time, I was dealing with Vince. You know when I was on, on top. On top. And you know, Vince would make you feel like you were the most important person in the world. And then when my run was over, uh, I mean, Crickets. he, he would, wouldn't would give me mm. the time of day hardly. Wow. Other than hi and bye. But it, I realized it's because he's he's got to go set up Next. the matches. Right. He's got to go take care of the TV. You know, he was he was in charge of the production. He was He was in charge of everything, so he didn't have the time But I realized, you know, he's a businessman, you know, taking care. The guys that were on top, making him the money, those are the guys that he was making, making him, you know, he'd walk up to you and smile and like he, like he wanted to kiss you, you know, he he loved you, you know, because you, you were the one making the money for him. When, when he was done, you know, somebody else was dealing with you, you know, uh, somebody else was setting up the matches. Well, you were, uh blessed to be a two-time Intercontinental Champion, so I wanted to get to your second reign, which may, may seem on the surface to some to be a tr- almost a transitional champion when you pass it on to Macho Man Randy Savage. Any thoughts about the early days of the great Macho Man, your opinion on Randy? Well, the, the early days, they brought in Macho Man without a manager. I don't, you guys remember when yeah, sure. everybody was fighting for him? Yep. And then they introduced Elizabeth? Well, sure. Macho Man was was uh, doing TV tapings, and he was wrestling in house shows, and he wasn't getting any response whatsoever. Uh, you know, he wasn't getting over. He was he, he didn't start getting over until they put him in with Elizabeth, and they ended up working the angle pretty good. Wow. I worked with Macho Man in, in uh, Detroit, uh, and I let him call the whole match, and we didn't hardly get any response. Which usually I would get a response, but I would put in my two cents. But I wanted him to see. I, I let him do the whole match. There wasn't that many people there. So after the match, I I, I talked to him and I said, uh, Randy, 
I said, I threw more drop kicks tonight than I've had probably in the, in the whole year here. <laughs> right. And I said, and you, you notice that they didn't mean shit. I said, here in New York, because he came back from Kentucky, the, they owned Kentucky, and he was the big dog in Kentucky. And to me, that was, he was used to having jabroni matches. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, because that's, that's what they were programmed in yeah. Kentucky. You know, mm-hmm. high spot, high spot, high spot, mm-hmm. high spot. I said, New York is different. New York, they want a fight and a little bit of wrestling. I said, they're used to Bruno San Martino. Yep. Kicking and punching yeah, and beating some the shit out of somebody. Yeah. Is they want a fight and a little bit of wrestling. I said, you need to incorporate a fight and a little bit of, ma- you know, of, of, of wrestling. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have heard Randy would come in with the two or three pages of high spot, you know, yeah. the match, you know, yeah. Yeah. Up, and, and he would forget because it's, I mean, he forgets some of the stuff. And he wasn't sharp enough to, okay, let's take it off and you know, go from here to there. So he wanted purely a scripted match right. from start to finish. He, and he was, you know, Lanny said he's a, he was a perfectionist. And you, you dealt with that. T- is this the first time dealing with someone at this, this uh, I don't know, maybe OCD type of situation where he wanted everything exactly the way it was supposed right. to be? Did you ever and, work with anybody po- as prepared as Randy? Well, at that point, you're a bigger star than him. Yeah. Do you say, hey, look, dude. I'm going to tell you how that, like you just said, how it's going to be done. And was he open to it? So you tell him all this. What does he say to you? Well, because I remember the first time that he got lost and, and, I, and I got us back on track. Uh, I remember George Steele, uh, he did the same thing with George and George took the paper, you know, <laughs> and, and, and tore it up. Uh, yeah. Did he chew on it and spit it up? Right. Hey, let's have this match. Okay. I, <laughs> so then, wow. uh, Wait. I think eventually he started weeding out of, uh, of uh, you know, because we learn, you got, you, uh, Mr. Fuji taught me, he says, you, you have to go in there and listen to the people. They'll tell you what they want. And at the beginning, I used to say, what the hell is he talking about? So him? true, though. Yeah. yeah. He says, listen to the people, you know, just, mm-hmm. they'll, t- they'll tell you what they want. They'll tell you everything. And, yeah. and, and, and that's why Jesse the Body was so good. The people want to come here and they want to be part of the show. So... You know, look at the people and, you know, get them involved, you know, in the match and messing around with the with the people in the, in the front row and stuff. It, it took Randy a while to to master that, but, I mean, he turned out to be yeah, one heck of a heel. Oh, boy. But oh, uh, I, think, I think the fact, I mean, the, they did it perfect, you know, they but got... The, 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 the Elizabeth introduction was needed she was as big as a star as he was and there's nothing wrong with saying right. that right she was no, no, you know, it's all. great that you talk about her though the rumors about the way he treated elizabeth in the back locking her away from the boys is this true were you was it was can you tell us a few stories maybe well he was a he was a very jealous man and uh, uh understandably because the wrestlers in general, I mean, you, you guys know, I mean, how many wrestlers have lost a wife to another wrestler? Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, that's as low as it gets. Yeah, yeah. Mean, it's yeah. tough. <laughs> you you got to, I mean, gotta, I mean, move into somebody. Uh, so he had a right, to, he had a right to feel protective. He was just over right. the top. Yeah, he, he, knew the, he, he knew the business, and, but, but he was extremely jealous. Okay. And uh, he'd lock her up in the room and you, you had a sick, secret knock. knock. I remember there was a guy, uh, his name is Mark, in, in Tampa, in Toronto, and, and he forgot to knock, and, did, and and he opened the door, and he says, I told you the secret knock, knock, you know? <laughs> so uh, <laughs> The secret knock, the knock. Secret yeah. knock. Oh, my God. That's the knock, knock. Right. Wow. So, wow. Uh, you know, you know, he was definitely yeah. overprotective, and, and I mean, she was a beautiful yeah. woman. man. You know? yeah. Did you did you ever interact with her? And no, no, no. No, he didn't let he didn't let anybody talk. He Just couldn't even her. talk to her. No, I mean, if I, if we were. I did team up with him, me and Rick, and you know, six men tags, and mm-hmm. we would talk a little bit over the finish and stuff like that. But that was it. You know, she, th- there was no much interaction. That's why I was totally surprised. You know, the way it turned out at the end. You know, where all of a sudden, I was with Randy Savage in in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, when he got served with papers that uh, with divorce oh papers, oh my god! And uh, I mean, he was devastated. He he left and went to Florida that, yeah. that night. And uh, I'm sure you guys know the little heat there with Hogan. You know, sure. he, he blamed Hogan 
because supposedly she was, I mean, you hear a lot of crap, but supposedly she was having an affair with a police man in Tampa, and she was having an affair with the the, the, the guy that was making the movie with uh, Hogan in, in Miami. So not only having one, she was having uh, two different affairs. So I guess when, you know, Randy was, in, she got off the road and Randy was on the road, you know, I, I think she just... Uh, Cats away. Yeah. I mean, she's, she Oy. just got tired of being, yeah. you know, too much, I think, man. Who knows? Perhaps, I mean, I know. perhaps. Uh, I want to move on. You wind up with uh, gold again in Vince's company with the strike force with the tag gold. I got to ask you your thoughts on Rick Martel and this is driving me nuts. I want this man in the Hall of Fame. Do you feel that Rick Martel deserves to be in the Hall of Fame? Oh, without a doubt. I, I was talking to, to Eric on the way over here and I said, there's got to be something that happened that this guy is not in the Hall of Fame. I mean, is there something that happened? I don't know. I mean, it, it, when's the last time you spoke to Rick Martel? Probably a couple of years ago. You know, he, he doesn't do too many appearances. Your thoughts on his work as the model, because I thought that his heel work there was just stellar. Well, that's I wanted to be the model. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, not, not necessarily the model. I wanted to be the heel when we broke up, and, and uh, I, because we had teamed up in in, in the AWA before, so, right. and. We were we had done really good things as partners over there, so uh, when he came back as the model <laughs> with the gimmick, I realized all oh, this was under uh, under plans for for a while, right. and I had no, not not I had so I more, had no more snake about this. more snaky crap <laughs> more snaky yeah. crap. Right. <laughs> why why do you feel like the wrestling industry like they can't like share their plans? Why because you're going to go rogue and ruin it for them? Or, I mean, we talk about this all the time. I don't know if you watch the product nowadays, but they they make sure that no one gets big enough that they're bigger than the company. Yeah. You know, it points, you know, Hogan. The company yourself, is the star. Savage. Not right. the wrestlers. Stone Cold. Right, they don't want that That to seems anymore. to be their, their method nowadays. Nobody can right. get too big anymore. You can't have a Hogan. can't have an Austin. You know, if they get too big, like Mike says, they pull you back. Yeah. The star is the, is the logo. So right. we, we have a show every Sunday, uh, the Evan Ginsberg show. He's associate producer for The Wrestler. Remember the movie The Wrestler? Right. Yeah. So Evan is a big proponent for professional wrestlers having a union because a lot of guys are either, you know, strung out, injured, whatever. Medical. And that, you know, the WWE should, you know, at least take care of them. Why? Where, where's the line, Miller? The most eclectic show on the radio. Thank you. Bingo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why can't Rant. the professional wrestling group get together and unionize? Why are you guys this individual? You know, is it just individual about yourself? Yes. That, why does this never happen? Well, I don't know if you guys remember. Jesse the Body tried right before WrestleMania one, and it, it went around, and a lot of the guys were going to get together and get a union were you in on it were you like i'm going for it yeah yeah okay most of us most of us were in on it you wanted it yeah we we, we wanted it why not including hulk hogan well <laughs> a few days before hulk hogan uh, you know what the show yeah. hulk hogan says i'm not doing it well hulk hogan was making eight million dollars a year the next closest guy was making uh maybe 750 to a million so hogan wasn't willing to some of the guys they were on top, you know, as the leaders, uh, got let go right away when they found out they were pushing it. But th th those were the ones that were trying to, you know, uh, organize the whole they thing. They got the system. So uh, Billy, cut. Yeah. What, could poss could it be possible that people were scared of Vince? Because Billy Jack Haynes was in last week, <laughs> and he claims oh, yeah. that Vince killed, you know, Ultimate Warrior, Randy Savage. Vince, v Vince Chris is Benoit. behind everything. <laughs> Did you know Billy Jack Haynes at all? Yeah. What, did you know Billy Jack Haynes was um, one of the major cocaine distributors in the 1980s? Uh, I knew that he was in, uh, that he almost got killed in in, uh, in Oregon uh, with some of the dealers that he messed up or, or didn't. So you pay. had heard some service. right? And something he, interesting. Him for dead, you know, but I didn't wow. know how. In, like I wasn't friends uh, with uh, Billy Jack. Haynes. You had no he relation. was in New York for a little while, right? So, you, know, you didn't run in his circle. No, gotcha. No. Interesting. Who Interesting. was your circle? Uh, Besides Andre, who else were your buddies in this business? Believe it or not, 
I used to hang out like with the bushwhackers. <laughs> I can see this. That's a fun, <laughs> that's a fun time. <laughs> oh, oh, hey. with, with Mr. Wonderful, okay. with uh, okay. with Barry uh, Barry Darso and Bill Eady. Okay. You know, uh, demolition for the fans. Guys that weren't, you know, really, you know, there was the guys that were messed up with the drugs, and, and you know who they who they were. Right. So, you know. Like they would offer me stuff, and I said, "No, no, I, I, I'm not going to take it because I'm not, I'm never going to reciprocate." Were, were you, were you concerned though, getting in a ring with some of these guys that were, you know, lit up? Because you know, I'm sure they were lit up getting in the ring yeah, with you, one, and this is a one, dangerous sport. One is, you know, move, yeah. your neck, yeah, you know, you, whatever. You, you were, you were concerned. You know, uh, I was concerned, so you were extra cautious when you knew because you knew when they were really, but for the, because I mean. They were. I saw people taking bumps in, you know, in, in the locker room, you know, before you going in and stuff. And, Great. You know. So it was <laughs> a, it was a scary situation, you know, whenever you would uh, go in a ring, you know, because, I mean, somebody coming off the top rope with a knee on your chest, you know, you, Rick Martel's brother got killed uh, with a knee and the, you know, punctured, uh, broke ribs and punctured his lung in wow. Puerto Rico, and so a, a little. You're off a little bit, you know. It could be a deadly mistake, you know. So you you would get concerned. So you, you know, once once you get smart enough, you don't allow yourself to be in those situations. Speaking of concerned, how concerned were you when they gave you the El Matador gimmick? I would have been concerned. Well, I I I had talked to Vince and I said, Vince, you know, uh, I'm not happy. You, you know, you're not using me to my, uh, you know. I feel I have a lot more to offer than what you're getting, you know, what you're giving me. You know, you're not allowing me. He says, I got one more run for you. He says, uh, would, you, would you be opposed to becoming a matador, going to Mexico and training to become a bullfighter? I said, if you're going to give me a push, I said, I'll do whatever you want. So he did. He sent me to Mexico and he rented the whole uh, arena. And he spent a lot of money. You know, the guys that were there filming told me, He's, he's going to give you a big push because he's spending a lot of money. Well, at the time, I think they were planning on going into Mexico, South America, Central America, Spain. Because I had wrestled in Spain against The Undertaker in 92, and I beat him in Spain. Wow. We were the main event. We sold out, you know, the place. Uh, so I figured they were getting me ready to... Because to, Pat Patterson is the one that kept telling me, we're going to go into South America, Central America... And there were, I know, because Bruce Pritchard again told me that they were considering me, they, they were going to put the belt on me, he told me. Wow. So uh, I don't think I needed the El Matador gimmick. And I never liked it because, you know, because they didn't push it. If they would have pushed it, I, I would have liked it. Uh, me is, is me doing the Meta, Matador gimmick. I don't know how good I did the gimmick, you know. But I don't think I needed a gimmick. You were well, fine for what they asked you right. to do. It wasn't right. on you. For me, you know? for me as a fan, I thought it was almost insulting. Right? You had a this career, and I, you know, I, I remember the time they're dressing everybody up and everything. So I guess yeah, you it was had also to get that along, time period. Too, I, right? Fair. I wasn't yeah. happy with it. I had a lot of respect for your work, and I was like, I just didn't like it. You know, I thought I thought you could stand on your own for sure. When me you too. see when you see the high flyers of today, and you see how wrestling has changed, everybody's become a gymnast almost. It seems like that you were flying around way before these people. How do you feel? Do you feel like you know the business has improved with all the flying around, or do you wish it would be somewhere in the middle, a little bit more of the, like you said, a fight and a wrestling match? I mean, what should wrestling be today well, in your mind? It's, I, I'm not a fan. I don't watch it. Fair enough. You know, I can't tell you the, the last time I watched it was when the Undertaker, I mean, uh, the Ultimate Warrior, WrestleMania. I was at a wow. WrestleMania party and a long time ago. Uh, and <laughs> they paid me to watch it, so I watched it. <laughs> All right, I'll so, watch it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. That's so, hilarious. So that was, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, is it over? Arriva. <laughs> but, <laughs> that's great. But I know Very Steve funny. Kern. Uh, Steve Kern. And, okay. and I would, I would see Steve Kern, and he would say, "One week they want you to do this. One week he says, it's it's they, they don't want you to be a worker like we were." Mm. You know that now they they do stuff for, for for no reason. They just do really really high risk maneuvers. Yes. 
uh, that really doesn't mean crap. No storyline. Yeah. No, no storyline, no, story no passion. Line. And 50-50 booking. Like, let's say you beat me this week, I get to beat you next week. Doesn't that, that sound exciting? You're going to really get over now. So we're, we're, No one knows who you are if you're mediocre. Everybody's 50-50 booking now. We're getting towards A the lot end. Of them. We're getting towards the end. Tito, in your this great career that you've had, what would you consider the highlight of your career? Wow. There's a lot to go through. And there is a lot to There's go through. There's a lot to go through. Probably, the, the, looking back, the highlight of my career was when I got inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, when Pedro Morales got inducted into the Hall of Fame, the first Hall of Fame was in Baltimore in a hotel. They had maybe 100 people there. You know, they inducted him and, and uh, the four, about four guys they inducted him mm -hmm. into the Hall of Fame, the WWE. Mm -hmm. And you were inducted it, it was, in 2004. It, it, yeah, it was nothing. You know, I think it, that was in 2000. It was right. nothing. So when they, when uh, Howard Finkel called me and, and says, uh, you can, they, they want to induct you into the Hall of Fame in 2004, to me it didn't mean nothing because I had been to that one. So I, I, like I said, when I left, I wasn't watching it. So I didn't realize how big it was getting. So I said, well, how much am I going to get paid? So I don't know if you guys know this, but in general, I think the guys that they bring in, they, they pay them uh, five thousand dollars. So that's what they, you know, that's what the, the going rate right. was. Plus flight, and plus hotel flight, and all stuff, expenses yeah. and, and, and everything. So when he told me five thousand dollars, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll oh, get yeah. inducted into the hall. What if they would have offered you nothing? Uh, I would have gone. You said that, right? Wow. Yeah, I and mean, that's why I asked how much. Yeah. Uh, like the million dollar man says, everybody has a price. You know, you have to pay me something. Yeah, but when I got my, they they flew my, my my brother, my sister in law, my mom, my my, uh, I think another sister from Texas. Uh, they got us four hotels downtown New York. They they sent two limousines to my house to pick us up, uh, and and I didn't know any of this. Was you treated this. like a king. Yeah, they got treated nice. like a king. Arrived in New York. And then it's when I saw you all, realized that's when I saw all the fans. I said, "God, oh my God, what is this?" You know, I feel like I was a you know uh, like a, a hall of famer from a major, major, major right. promotion. Yeah. yeah, that's what you were. <laughs> well, you are. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Except when it ends, they probably had a cab waiting for you at the end. Right? What? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the yellow cab <laughs> and a Wendy's coupon. <laughs> what? So, uh, and then and, and then when when the Hall of Fame, the night when I when I had to do the speech, yeah. Uh, what a class, by the way. That whole class yeah, was awesome. Class. Yeah. Greg my, was in that class. My yeah. wife my wife kept saying, uh, do you know what you're going to talk about? Mm. I said, no, I don't. And I saw all these guys with page, Morocco had a, <laughs> pages of, <laughs> Morocco. of notes and stuff. And and uh, and I said, I, I'm just going to think. You know, my I had gone through some tragedies in my family and... and, and you know, I, 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 I talked about, I just spilled it from my heart, you know, and, and I thank the people that, it, that you know, I, I felt, I've, I could have been the world champion, I wasn't. Even with that, I felt like I was very blessed and I had a great career. Oh, my Lord, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, my family, uh, I was able to put all my kids through college. They all have great educations. They're, they're all doing fantastic. And, yeah. you know, I, I felt blessed, you know, so I just felt like thank, thanking everybody. Don't forget the salon, you know. Right. Yeah. You got all of this going well, on. Well, I, right. I could tell you we, uh, as fans, first of all, we feel blessed that you were in this profession. You were one of the greatest of all time. And we feel blessed to have you on the show. And we have feel blessed to have Eric Sims in from yeah. the ESS, Eric. Go on over, big Come man. Come on in, big man. Give him the form. No BS with ESS. You want to uh, share where <laughs> Mr. Santana will be for the rest of the weekend? All right. So, uh, from 1 to 3 p.m., we will be at the Wrestling Universe in Queens, New York. So, uh, Francis Lewis Boulevard, uh, anybody that's a wrestling fan knows where the Wrestling Universe is. So uh, come check us out at the Wrestling Universe from 1 to 3 p.m. And then tonight, we will be in uh, Bayville, New Jersey, uh, SWF 
live at the Elks Lodge, and Tito has a big match tonight with uh, Rhett Titus and Rhett's in Ring of Honor, and you know oh, yeah. one of the young bucks from Ring of oh, yeah. Ring of Honor, not the the young bucks, mm-hmm. but one of the young talents over Nowhere. at uh, Ring of Honor, and he's a he's a hell of a talent that lives in the area, so that's gonna that's gonna be it's like almost like a dream match down there, and it's gonna be really fa- fantastic, uh, and then. Uh, so that's that's uh, where Tito and I are going to be for today, and uh, the road to WrestleCon tour uh, next stop is WrestleCon, and uh, Tito will be there at his table, and I will I will have uh, Val Venus and Billy Jack Haynes at my table, and uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a fun weekend at uh, WrestleMania weekend, April f- uh, five, six, and seven. It's a big weekend. What are you laughing at? Just don't get too close to Billy Jack Haynes. <laughs> 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 There's gonna be uh, something uh, behind uh, that. Uh, <laughs> to, uh, I'm not doing my plugs yet. No, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Billy Jack. Go on. Uh, please, I have to do. I have to put the website out now. Go Thank on. you. Thank Go you. On. You're on a roll. No, thank you. Okay. So anyway, uh, all the information on about ESS and all its talents and wherever I'm going to be with my talents is www.esspromotions.com, uh, and we know all the. Catchphrases, uh, no BS with ESS. You know, we're all sensational. And remember, business and success end in ESS. Excellent. Tito, it's been our pleasure. Um, we wish you only the best of luck. You are a hero of many. And we thank you for coming on our program. Thank you, guys. All thank right. You, Tito. Sure. All right, Farrell, send us out, brother. I'm not sending us out. I want him to send us out with his Ariba. Give it to us, Tito. Well, uh, I'll do it like this, and then Tito, let's hit it with an Ariba. Catch Monty DeFaro every Thursday, 8.05 to 9 p.m. only here at Village Connection Radio. Uh, Coming up on the 4th, we've got Coco Beware, and then after that, we'll be promoting the DVD release of 350 Days. Are you in that? Yes, I am. I know you are. That's a quick move by me. So you also see Tito Santana in 350 Days. Uh... The uh, associate producer, Evan Ginsberg, will have uh, Greg Valentine either by Skype or in studio. Coco is already in with us, and then Coco will continue on. And if you're lucky enough, you'll get to see me dance with no. Coco no. to no. pile drive. I quit. No. You know what I'm, really, yeah, you know what I'm looking forward no, to? Don't dance to pile Coco's drive. a great town. I'm looking to, for Stan Hansen. That's a... That's a <laughs> That's, that's a later on. That's a, that's you know, a great I, interview. Speaking of pile drive, I'm a little pissed off they didn't put you in that video. In pile, Tito and pile driver. Do you remember that video, Why? pile driver? The wrestling album. The wrestling album. He's trying to forget it. Look at him. You were part of that, right? I, th- I thought I was. You, you were, <laughs> in, but you weren't in the video. You were on the album. I think you're in right. a land of a thousand dances. You're yeah. in that video. You, were you actually singing in that? Yes, yes. Did you enjoy wow. that? Uh, well, I, I'm not well. much of a singer, but I. <laughs> <laughs> they make you sound like a million dollars. Right. Well, well, anyway, well, thank everybody for joining. Mr. Santana, send us out. Arriba!